If you change your mind, you change your life, just change your mind. The Lord loves you. He's standing with his arms wide open. Cause this day's for you Don't you let this opportunity pass by you yeah. oh, Change your mind Hey family, this is Pastor Wendell Jones And welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study Listen, got some good stuff for you tonight <laughs> I really do So, you know, grab something Cause you're gonna want to take notes tonight as a matter of fact, I'm going to try to be real faithful to my notes. And I'm, I'm telling y'all that because I need y'all's permission because I know y'all. Y'all y'all feel like it's better if it's coming straight off the dome and I'm, and I'm not looking at my notes. I know y'all. But listen, I put a lot of time in these notes. And I don't want to miss some of these points that the Holy Spirit revealed to me as I was preparing. Yes, we are dissecting the sermon uh, from Sunday. But guys, I got some deeper and some clearer understanding and revelation. And I got to give it to you. So after we pray, well, grab something now <laughs> so we can uh, begin to talk about this. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Listen, Father, we thank you so much for just this opportunity. I'm excited because of the clarity you're giving to me. And I'm also excited that you're using me to, to, to give this to your people. Help me not to fumble over myself too much, God, uh, out of my excitement or out of any insecurity that might rise up in me tonight. Help me to give it to your people because, God, I think this really allows us to step, uh, take another step closer to being able to produce the glory that you have designed us to do. Holy Spirit, I need you. I need you. I need you. And I know you are in me and I know you are my helper and I trust you. Together, we will do great exploits. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Sunday is one of those lessons. Uh, it's called the, the Wilderness Education. It's one of those um, sermons uh, that I love to try to give to you that's, that's, as the title says, is educational. Listen, I'm of the belief, you know, we got to give you something of substance. We got to give you something that you can do, something that you can understand. This Bible that God created for us is filled with answers upon answers, principles upon principles. It is designed to help you get to your life and do your life well so that when it's time for you to leave here, you're not trying to fight death. You can say like Paul said, I fought a good fight. fight. I finished my course. That's what I want to do. And that's what motivates me in teaching you because I don't want to do it my, just by myself. I want you to get it. So come on, let's look at some of this. Um, let's look at these scriptures from the Old Testament. Exodus 7 and 16. It says this, then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they can worship me in the wilderness. God has given Moses instructions on how he should talk to Pharaoh. Then let's look at Numbers, the 11th chapter and the 5th verse through the 6th verse. And it said this, these are the children of Israel. They're out, they don't, they've, they've left bondage. They're out there in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And this is how they're talking to Moses. And they said this, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. <laughs> and let's jump over two chapters to Numbers 13. Slide down to the 27th verse to the 31st verse, and it says this. This is, well, let me tell you what this is. They've, they've, they've gone through the wilderness, and they're close enough to Canaan, the promised land, and Moses has sent over the 12 spies to check out the land, and now they're back, and they're giving Moses their report of what they saw over in the promised land. And so they said this. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey, because here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. They're saying all of our historical enemies are over there. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses. Caleb got fed up with all of that complaining. And he said, we should go up and take possession of the land. 
but we can certainly do it. And then the people spoke back up. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. A wilderness education. That's what we need. You know, I got kind of stuck on verse 29. Again, I didn't really preach about that Sunday, and I didn't really plan to talk about it much tonight. But look at that again. The Amalekites living in the Gav, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Let me just throw this nugget out there to you before we get into this. Wherever your promised land is, your enemies are there. Wherever it is that you desire to be, wherever it is that you believe God has carved out for you to, to excel, please, ma'am, please, sir, don't think you're going to get over there. And, and the indication that you've arrived is that there is no opposition, that there's nobody hurling stones, that there's nobody over there that remembers your past, that there's nobody over there trying to sabotage your work. Listen, when it gets real intense, you just might be in your promised land. All your enemies are going to be there. But you still can thrive. So let's get to this. All right. Wilderness experience. Listen, told you I'm going to be faithful to my notes. Try to anyway. Wilderness experiences are necessary. <laughs> They're necessary because your mama was right. And I know your mama said this because my mama said it to me. You just got to learn the hard way, don't you? Wilderness experience, because we have to learn. We just insist. I think that was the word she used. You just insist on learning the hard way. Hmm. You know, it's, it's God's desire that, you know, we, he just talks to us. God's desire that he sends somebody in your life. It's God's desire that you listen to me tonight and you take these notes and say, okay, cool, I'm going to run and do it. But here's what the reality is. Most of us just got to learn the hard way. And I get it. I'm not trying to beat you or me up about that because I get why we're here. I'm not trying to make excuses for us. I'm just trying to <laughs> say that I have some understanding. But just because we understand where we are doesn't mean we need to stay here. But here's why we do what we do. We're some stubborn little somebodies, which makes it hard for us to teach, be, be hard for somebody to teach us anything. Life with all of its trauma and life with all of its bad information that we've already received makes it very difficult for us to be taught something. We already got something in there that we already holding on to. We already got some trauma. We already got some issues. We already got some church hurt. We already got some issues with preachers. We already got some issues with teachers. We've had some bad experiences. Somebody told us not to listen to nobody. Somebody told you ain't nobody got no business telling you what to do. We've got all kind of foolishness that's already circulating inside of us that makes us very unteachable or difficult to teach. And because of that, we have to go through some wilderness experience. See, you and I, what can happen with us, we can hear a thing over and over. But until we experience it, we still, until we experience it, we don't put the proper value on the lesson. What I mean by that, unfortunately for us, Many of us get our lessons in what they call hindsight. You know, you heard people say hindsight is 20-20. What that means is this. I heard the lesson back there. I was given the lesson before I was placed in the opportunity. I was given the information before the moment occurred. But because of my stubbornness or my, my, my insistence upon not valuing what was taught to me, I wasn't ready for my moment. But then hindsight happens. Hindsight, listen, y'all, is one of the most painful lessons. You know why? Because hind, when you say I got it in hindsight, that is saying that the opportunity has already passed us by. I don't see how valuable the lesson was. I didn't see that I was given the opportunity to prepare myself so I could be successful when that thing came over the horizon. I just didn't value what the preacher said. I didn't value what my parents said. I didn't value what my friends said. I didn't value the lesson. But once the moment came and went, I realized that I was given a chance to be great at something. And I missed it because I'm holding on to something else, some trauma, some bad information, some stubbornness. And so God has to 
take us through these wilderness experiences so we can begin to understand something. Now, hindsight says it's in the past. Now, here's, here's the thing that's great about God and great about life is that a similar, similar, not the same one, but a similar circumstance is going to come again. So it's still important for you that even though you know you missed it and you can look back now and see clearly that the lesson was for you, I'm trying to warn you. A similar opportunity is going to come back. A similar job opportunity, a similar relationship, a similar similar promotion, whatever it is that you messed up or missed because you've been stubborn, hard-headed, not willing to learn, it's going to come back again. That's how life works. Life repeats itself. Listen, y'all, listen to me, please. Life repeats itself until we get the lesson. Life repeats itself. The same stuff happens to you over and over again until you get the lesson. You cannot be promoted out of that cycle until you get the lesson. That's why we have curses. You know, the, the whole notion of a curse is that I'm stuck in this thing. And sometimes we stay stuck in it so long that it becomes a generational curse. See, if you and I would get out of it ourselves, then our kids wouldn't learn it. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't go on to another generation. It wouldn't go on to your grandkids. But because we don't get it, and then kids come along and watch us cycling through the same stuff, cycling through the same thinking and beliefs and behaviors, now it passes on to another generation. We get the lessons because God wants us to, God just simply wants us to change, y'all. But here's something I've learned. Change in us normally comes two ways. Number one, change comes by inspiration. Or number two, change comes by tragedy or trauma. Did you hear that? Change. We are receptive to change. Let me say it right. You and I are more receptive to changing, more receptive to becoming. Because you, we know we, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be evolving, steadily becoming something more, something wiser, something stronger, going from glory to glory because we're going from faith to faith. But that change that's supposed to be natural for us because of all the stuff that we've gone through, all the conditioning, all the stuff, and it's all the stuff I've been talking about, it normally only happens for two reasons. Number one is inspiration, but number two is through tragedy or trauma. Which one of those you think is more prevalent? How about with you? Did you change because you were inspired? And, when, when it's, and, 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 and being inspired, that's God's desire. When God talks about the word, he says that the word of God is, is God inspired. That word inspired literally means to breathe life into. God is trying to get me and you to change, to breathe new life into us. So he would love for words to inspire us, words to be snatched out of the air and apply it to our lives. And we're going to go do something better. We're going to stretch ourselves. We're going to release some stuff and take, put some new stuff in this place. That's God's desire for us. And it's, it really ought to be our desire. You know why? Because we ain't got all the time in the world. You ain't got an unlimited amount of time. But unfortunately for us, most of the change that we go through is once we... <laughs> Once we've gone through some tragedy, once we've gone through some serious loss or some serious trauma, then you say, man, I got to change. But here's the reality. Before that tragedy that, or that trauma or that loss happens, there were several lessons offered to you by which you could have been inspired. But because we don't want to get it that way, often we are pulled into a wilderness experience. Let me back up and say this to you again. God prefers inspiration. God prefers that a word be given to you. But listen, if your inner man, or if you might want to call it your subconscious, or your conditioning, listen how I say that. Prefers pain. Did you get that? That might sound crazy to you, but just think about it. Sometimes who you are on the inside is so familiar with pain 
that, you, that pain becomes your preference and that you're not willing to do something different until it just hits rock bottom, until it's burned all the way down to the ground. Then all of a sudden you're ready to change. But how much do you have to lose? How many, how, what's your body count for you to have, for you to continue to operate that way? But we got to be honest. Many of us have an affinity toward pain because that's what we were brought up in. Feel like don't nobody love you till they hurt you. Hmm. God prefers us to learn another way. And see, this whole wilderness experience that I'm talking about, the wilderness experience can be painful. You know why? Here's why it's painful. Because the wilderness experience strips you of what's familiar. That's really what it does. It strips you of what's familiar. Because the wilderness, by definition, is an uninhabited land. It's there. It's got a whole bunch of stuff to it, but it's just unfamiliar. We consider walking in the unfamiliar to be painful because we have a love affair with the familiar, even if the familiar ain't loving us back. And what I mean by that, sometimes what you're familiar with is incredibly painful, incredibly toxic. It is it's killing you, killing. It ain't even killing you softly. It's killing you loudly. But it's the pain, you know. And so what God has tries to do to get you out of that thing to get you to new places, to get you to a place where your willingness to hear differently so you can become different, he pulls you into this place that's unfamiliar. Hmm. But let me share something with you that I've learned. The reason we struggle with the unfamiliar, and some of y'all might be offended by this, but just hear me out for a minute. The reason we struggle with the unfamiliar is because we lack faith. You don't have as much faith as you think you do. Because faith requires me to embrace the unfamiliar. Faith requires me to move into dimensions that I haven't been in before. Faith to faith, to, to, to the next level that I've never occupied before. But the reason we're not open to the unfamiliar, we lack faith, y'all. Hmm. What's amazing to me is I watch some of us, Tina, some of us got courage for, to be adventurous. We got courage, you know, to travel, courage uh, 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 to take new jobs, courage to go from person to person, relationship to relationship. But when I'm talking about this faith and this unfamiliar, I'm wondering if you have the courage to think differently. That's what God wants to know. Can I, can I expose you to a higher level of thinking? Can I give you another level of revelation so that you can live at a higher level? so that you can produce more out of that same person, that, that you, you right there. There's so much that's untapped inside of you that you hadn't even produced yet because you're still trying to stay in the loop of what's familiar. God pulls us, listen to me. He, he wants you to step into the unfamiliar or he pulls you into the unfamiliar because here's what he's trying to do. He's trying to heal you. He's trying to heal me and you. He pulls us into the, to the wilderness so that we can stop receiving the reinforcing of old information from external sources. Hear, hear, hear what I'm trying to say there. God wants you out of the familiar because while you're in the place of what's familiar, that bad information, that limiting information, that stuff that's got you acting beneath yourself is being reinforced by your environment, external stuff, stuff that's on the outside of you. And so God tries to give me and you a fighting chance by pulling us out of it so we can stop hearing the same stuff, stop seeing the same stuff, so that we now may have an opportunity to open our eyes to something new, be exposed to something new. So, But listen to me. Although God can pull you away from external stuff, you and I still have this will. <laughs> It doesn't, because he pulls you into the wilderness, it doesn't stop you. It doesn't stop me from reinforcing my bad teaching, my bad examples. He's helping you out. You're no longer having to deal with this, uh, deal with that stuff that you see all the time. That's caused you to think it was normal. 
But even when he puts you in an unfamiliar place, you can reinforce it yourself. This is exactly what was going on with the children of Israel. Although Moses pulled them out of bondage, they took bondage with them. You ever did that? You've been given a brand new opportunity, new job, new relationship, new whatever, new church, whatever, new state. You got away from the external thing that was keeping you bound, but you took the bondage with you. I need you to understand something that I'm coming to grips with. God has a plan for you, but you have a will. And that will is that place in your soul. Your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotion. Your will is that place of determination. I've made up my mind. You have a will that can always hijack God's plan for you. God keeps putting his plan for you in motion. But your will, which has been conditioned by the places he's trying to pull you out of, the will of the children of Israel had been conditioned for generations of being used to being slaves, being used to being in bondage, being used to being in captivity, being used to being bound. No, nobody's got literal shackles on your feet. Nobody's forcing you to make bricks without straw like the children of Israel. But what's holding you captive? Listen, Jesus says it's about you and me. Because before I go here, I'm, I'm realizing there's still some areas that hold me down, some areas that I'm still held captive to. You know why? Because I keep hearing the scripture, the very familiar scripture, that I can do all things. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If you don't believe you can do whatever God asks you to do, if you don't believe or feel a sense that you are free, then there's some bondage that you have taken with you. Your will can hijack God's plan for you. And we see that happening in Exodus 7 and 16. Let's go back and let's look at this. Let's look at God's plan. God's plan is being revealed in Exodus 7 and 16. And it says, then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. This is God's plan. This wasn't just God's plan for Israel. This is God's plan for you. Uh, anybody that finds themselves bound. God says, listen. I need them to come away from Pharaoh. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Come away from the situation. Come away. Even if it's just once, it's just one day a week called Sunday. Come away. Come away and do what, God? Come, come away and come out into what's unfamiliar. I ain't used to church. I ain't used to being around these church folks. I ain't used to doing this. I ain't used to whatever. He said, come to some place that's unfamiliar. But when you get there, here's what I want you to do. I'm bringing you out here, not to just make you uncomfortable. I'm bringing you out here so you can do what? Worship me. That wasn't just a plan for Israel. That was a plan for you and me. Here's why. And I got to get you to understand that. Because God didn't say, I, I want you just to come and hear, hear the praise team, the choir sing, or hear your favorite song and lift your hands. Now, don't get me wrong. Ain't nothing wrong with any of that. But there's a, there's a deeper intention for worship than for your favorite song to be played. Worship can, ha worship can happen and should be happening with you without there being a single chord play, single song sung, when you understand the intent of worship, what worship is really designed to do. Because a lot of times I think some of the stuff we're doing is not worship, we're just singing along with the people. What I want you to do is to learn, based on what I'm about to share with you, how to do this thing intentional, right, and in a powerful manner for yourself. The word worship is really the conjunction or the combining of two different words. The root word in that thing is worth. W-O-R-T-H. Worth. 
when you add the suffix on the end of ship, ship normally means the process of a thing. So worth ship, the process of developing your worth. Here's what worship does. And this is why it's not, we can worship more than just God. What worship does, whatever you worship now gives you your sense of worth. Did you hear that? You ever meet some people who worship their stuff? You know how they worship their stuff? They worship their home, they worship their job, worship their cars. You know why? Because it gives them their sense of worth. But God is saying, that's the principle. So he said, come out here and worship me. Come worship me so I can give you your sense of worth. Why is that even needed? Because God was talking to people who have been bound for generations. Listen, the only way you can be bound, listen, the only way you can be made to play small is if somebody and some bodies and some systems and some constant reinforcing has convinced you of living beneath your worth. Because you don't think you are worth being more. You don't think you are valuable enough to contribute. You don't think you're valuable enough to ask for things and believe in things and believe in yourself. And so if, you, if, if it's constantly reinforced that you are down here, then and only then can you be held down here. And so what God is trying to say to you and me is that if you will come to me with the intentions of talking to me so that you can hear from me, listen, about you. When I'm in worship, I'm telling God how wonderful he is. Yes, they're playing the song that I enjoy. The song is just my cue to go into my personal worship. And as I'm telling God how great thou art, I'm also listening to his response. Do y'all hear me? Yes, it's corporate worship and I miss corporate worship. But even in my corporate worship, I now know what the purpose of, and I'm talking to God and I'm asking him questions. And so sometimes when you see the tears streaming down my eyes, it's not because I love the words of the song, it's that I'm in love with what I'm hearing. God is telling me some stuff about me. God is telling me I love you right back. God is telling me you can overcome that. God sometimes speaks to me about specific issues in my worship. Man, I can feel that running through my body right now. God starts to tell me some stuff, but the things that he's telling me is how he feels about me and how he sees me operating at my full potential. What he's doing is establishing my worth. And, and, and listen, this, is, this isn't about arrogance. This is me talking to my creator. This, see, arrogance comes because I get stuff from folk. I'm trying to impress people. But when the, when the person who manufactures me tells me what I'm capable of, that's not arrogance. That's God saying, listen, you are living beneath your functionality. You can buy a brand new car. Let's say you bought a, a brand new car from BMW. Who can tell you the features of the car better than BMW? You'll be riding around in that thing. I remember one time, uh, Tina, when I, when I used to have my Mercedes, I had my Mercedes for two years before I realized I had a CD player in it. <laughs> it was hidden under the console. And one day I just, met, I just bumped up against something and the thing opened up. I said, what the world? I didn't even realize I had it. I just figured I didn't have a CD player. I just figured I had to listen to, 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 to the satellite stuff. But there was a CD player hidden off in there. I was living beneath the functionality of the car. And so in my worship, God is saying, man, you got all kind of compartments and contraptions there that you haven't even pushed. He says, so let me push it so it can open up and see what kind of abilities that you have. That's what worship is supposed to do. So God said, let's go back to Israel. He said, bring them out of that. Get them out of that situation. Get them out of that toxic relationship because they, they, they're over there believing that they're slaves. And see, some of them were captive, and then they had babies who were born into slave, like some of you were born into people who are already captive to whatever they were captive to. So you were born in a situation that you thought was normal, and so we're repeating these cycles, and God said, come here. Come here. Let me tell you, because you got somebody. Yeah, your mom and your daddy, they love you, but your mom and daddy are acting like me with that Mercedes. They, they got possession of it, but they don't know all the contraptions. 
And so I spent a couple years without even being able to enjoy a part of my car because I didn't check with the manufacturer. There are people who will try to influence you who have not checked with your manufacturer. And even if they do, they still don't know all the good things that are about you. And so at some point, you got to say, God, talk to me about me. That's what worship is. Come on out here. Bring them out here, Moses. And Moses' name means drawn out. <laughs> Moses is a type of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is trying to say, come here. Come here. Draw you out of a situation. Draw you into salvation if you're not a believer. And if you're already a believer, he's trying to lead you into all truth. What truth, Holy Spirit? Truth about you. Not just the truth about your God. Because here's the thing. If you learn all these wonderful things about God, you can recite them with the best of people. But if you can't learn the wonderful things about you, you're still talking about a God that you really can't relate to. But God starts to tell you these wonderful things about you. And so he says, come on out here. Because once you figure out what your worth is, listen, when you figure out your worth, it will disgust you to reach low, to, no, to live low. Not more reaching for somebody and pulling them up, but to live beneath. It will disgust you to fall short of the glory, short of your potential. But it will also, what worth will also do for you is give you the courage to reach higher because you'll start to believe I can. Most of you are not reaching because you don't think you're worthy. You're not worthy of it. You're not worthy, worthy of a better life. So you compromise. You're not worthy of stability. So you accept chaos. You're not worthy of prosperity and wealth. And you know I'm not a prosperity preacher. But you, you're not worthy of having more. Prosperity is really more about having excess, making a profit, meaning that you take in more than you put out. Because you need that to be able to leave an inheritance. You need that to be able to help somebody else. If you're exhausting all that you have, how can you be a source? But you're not doing it because you don't think you're worthy. And so you've run from all of these wilderness experiences where God has orchestrated you coming out of the familiar because the familiar was stifling you. It was suffocating you. But then you get over here in the unfamiliar and the wilderness, and your will kicks in. God took Israel out of bondage. He took them through the Red Sea, Pharaoh drowned, all of that. So you over here, and you're free. You're free from Pharaoh, but you're not free from your will. Hmm. See, see you, let me back up. See, you got to get free from, let's talk about Pharaoh. I almost went past Pharaoh, Tina. Hmm. God is trying to get us free from our pharaohs. See, Pharaoh didn't like what Moses was suggesting. Because remember, it took him forever to release them. God had to send the plagues and all of that. Because Moses said, listen, God wants them to come worship him. Pharaoh's like, time out, bro. I got this thing set up where they worship me. The pharaohs were considered to be gods themselves. Here's why. Because what I just taught you, whatever you worship, gets to tell you what your value is. And so if you are a slave and you worship Pharaoh and Pharaoh says you're a slave, you don't resist it that much. See, you've got Pharaohs in your life that need you to worship them so they can control your worth. We have modern day Pharaohs. And so you can figure them out. These are folks who, listen, Here's how you figure them out. Folks who don't want you to be too big. Folks don't, that want you to be capped off. Folks that say, you know, you're really doing too much. Folks say, why does it take all that? Folks that say, are you ever going to be satisfied? Folks say, why are you trying to leave me behind? That is a pharaohic spirit. And see, any one of us can be susceptible to that because we got these insecurities. So listen, anybody can yield to that. Don't, don't be a pharaoh. But you can begin to recognize the sound of pharaoh when they need you to be small. Not only do they need you to be small, watch this. Listen to me because some of y'all got to hear this. Pharaohs are real good at isolating you because they don't want you to hear nobody else's voice but theirs. 
They want to be the person who tells you who you are, what you can do, because that's their way of being able to hand you your worth. Hmm. Israel, in the text, they came to the Red Sea. They're over here and they're free. Pharaoh and his arm have been drowned. They're technically free from the captors, the people, but they're not free from what's in them. And so they start missing. Listen, I, I got to get you to hear this. They start missing the wilderness education, the one that was trying to invite them into worship so they can be educated on who they were. They start missing the education. Here's why. Because they were too busy complaining. You cannot worship and complain at the same time. See, worship is saying, I am me. Listen, listen, how, listen how I want you to process this. Worship will tell me my worth, and my worth is saying, I am. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Worship is saying that no matter where I was found, I'm becoming good enough to come out of it. If I'm becoming good enough to come out of it, I ain't got nothing to complain about. See, me complaining and saying, this is my lot in life. Me complaining and saying, man, this is this, woe is me, blah, 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 blah. But the person who's discovering his or her worth is saying, I don't like where I am, so I'm going to learn how to be better than where I am because I am where I am because I think I belong where I am. But listen, I'm learning some stuff about me. And so if you're watching me, watch me come up out of this. Not time to complain. But see, Israel couldn't grow because they were complaining. Here it is. Let me show you. They said it in the text. Look at uh, Numbers 11 and 5. We remember. Listen to this foolishness. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now we have lost our appetite because all we have out here is manna. We remember the good old days. We remember how it was when we were bound. See, sometimes we, because we're not allowing God to develop our, our worth. See, God can set you free. Whom the Son sets free? He, he can set you free. He can get you out of a situation. He really can. But getting the situation out of you requires your cooperation. And some of us are, 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 are loyal to the lessons. We're loyal to the, to the bad behavior of our parents. We're loyal to the things that we, 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 were, we taught, we were learned, stuff we learned before we learned God. You know, we did some dumb stuff, and, 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 and we'll hold on to those dumb lessons when God is offering you another way. He's offering you a chance to repent. He's offering you an opportunity to change your mind. He's offering you an opportunity to renew your mind. But we'll be loyal to old stuff. So we'll get a new relationship, but we'll still treat it like it's the old thing. We'll get a new job, but we'll still act like it's the old thing. We'll get a new church, but we'll still act like it was the last one. Because we brought that wheel with us. And so here you are complaining. When you know your situation is better. And, 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 and it's so crazy that, that we, can, we can look back at horrific situations and try to pull out little things that we can say was good. We had leeks and onions. We had cucumbers. But, but you forgot about being beaten. Hmm. You, you, you forgot about the Roman soldiers having the opportunity to rape your women. And uh, you forgot about... Pharaoh getting upset and taking away the straw and making you make bricks without straw. Did you forget about working from sun up to sundown with truly no compensation? And your only compensation was a bowl of leeks and onions? And now you're trying to act like that was good? We do all of that. We will act like the old days were good old days because we're more afraid of the unfamiliar. We act like it was the good old days because we overlook the fact that while I'm here, I need to worship. In the unfamiliar place, God showed me my worth. And so we're somewhere complaining. Watch this. You heard what they said in verse 6? They said, we ain't got no appetite because all we're getting is this manna. <laughs> we ain't got no appetite because we're living off of God's provision. We ain't happy, <laughs> but I got a plate full of Something I didn't provide for myself. We ain't happy, but my clothes haven't worn out. We ain't happy, but my shoes haven't worn out. We ain't happy, but my children, my children good. 
We ain't have because, but we didn't leave out empty handed because remember they left out with all types of valuable stuff. We had, we we got we had we got more now than we ever had before. But I ain't happy with God. The fact that God provided. See, here's here's oh here's the problem. I'm used to having to kill myself to get it. But here I am. I'm so still stuck where I was that I don't even realize I'm living off of a blessing that I am. I am in a blessed state. I am in the provision of God. I can't even, watch this. I can't even handle being blessed because I because 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 my inner man prefer pain. I was so tormented. I was so conditioned to being hurt. I was so conditioned to the struggle. I know some of y'all. Some of y'all ain't happy till you're struggling. As soon as you have some comeuppance, you, as soon as you come out the hole, you do something stupid to go right back in because you're just so used to having to struggle. You feel like struggle is part of your identity, part of your name. You think it's a badge of honor. And God shows up to be God and said, I want to do something better for you. I want to give you a better life. I want to give you better friends, better relationship, better this, better that. And you get right up and you jack it right up because it got to be struggle. It's got to be pain. Here they are. They are no longer subjected to the whip of the Roman soldier, of the Egyptian soldiers, rather. But here they are out here, wake up in the morning. They look outside. Oh, God, they prepared a meal. I don't, I, but it's just, man. <laughs> See, that ought to give you more incentive to do what? Worship. You think that much of me? <laughs> that you take the time out to bless me? See, that's not just you being good, God. That's saying that I'm good to you. In your eyes, I'm worthy of you providing for me? What is that? What should that be telling you about you? That I was way better than that. I'm, I'm worthy of God doing some things. And see, here's, 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 the, here's, the, here's the second layer. Let's dig a little deeper in the message that God is trying to give to us right there. The word manna meant what is it? What is it? What God is trying to get me and you to do. Wow, listen how this is so ridiculously awesome. That God. Let me stop right here. You asking the question, what is it, is not a foreign question for you. It's not. Because here's what you're used to. You're used to being in tough situations, painful situations, broken situations. Then you ask the question. What is it? What's going on? But can you handle this kind of situation where you're in the blessed situation? And you go, in your worship, God, what is it? What is it that makes you love me like you do? What is it that makes you invest in me like you do? There must be something wonderful, incredible, life changing that you want me to do, that my last situation was keeping me bound, that the stuff that you brought me up out of was was trying to tell me I, I must be some bad somebody. If the enemy had all this going on that tried to keep me from getting to this place where I could hear you, because as a matter of fact, I didn't tell you this. Another meaning of the word wilderness is to speak. God wants to get you to a place where you, he can talk to you. So what you going to tell me, God, I'm going to tell you about how good you are. I'm going to tell you about how intentional I was when I made you. I'm going to tell you about the goodness that's in you. I'm going to tell you, like I told Paul, that, there, that under, in this earthen vessel is hidden treasure. Treasure. <laughs> imagine if it's like, imagine if that was really God's intent. Regardless of all the stuff you did because of what you were taught, God said, come on out here and let me tell you something about yourself. But you got to come love on me so I can tell you. Come depend on me. Let me be the source of your value, the source of your worth. Don't just lift up your hands because everybody else is lifting. Lift up your hands, which is an international sign of surrender. I surrender. I surrender my ways because my ways are beneath you. I want yours because you do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think. I want to live in that place, God where I just keep repeatedly getting my mind blown and I'm somewhere again going, what is it? What is it? Oh, you're so good to me. What, is, what you want? What you want me to do? What you want me to do at this place? Mm, hallelujah. What do you want? Because you've been so good. 
man, you, you, you keep protecting me. You keep snatching me out. Even if I go in some place again, what, what, just tell me what is it? What, what is it that's so special about me to you that you keep preserving me? What is it? What is it that, that's so wonderful about me that you keep stitch, you keep, keep put, stitching my heart back together? What is it that, that's so incredible about me to you that, that, that you keep regulating the mind that I keep trying to drive crazy? What is it? That when I just blow it all up again, you show up and show me how to put these broken pieces back together to build another garden. What is it? There's something you're trying to get to me. Tell me what it is so I can give it back to you. Come on out here and worship. I'm going to stop there. I'm not even talking about Caleb and all of them and about the people in your life and making sure you have the right people in your life. We talked about that before. I need to. I just feel like I need to stop right here. What is it? What is it about me that makes you step into borrowed flesh and allow yourself to be ridiculed and spat upon and beaten? What is it about me that 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 still makes you risk yourself for me? Had you sinned one time, you would have stopped being God. What is it? about me what is it what are you trying to get to me what are you trying to get me to understand about me that 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 was worth you going to calvary and hanging there till you died what is it what is it that made you have a willingness to be laid in a borrowed tomb what is it what is it for you to make those contributions toward me there must be some equivalent value in me that i have yet to tap into And so I'm going in this wilderness so I can talk to you. And so you can talk back. Oh, I hope I'm making sense to you. The takeaway from Sunday said this. My wilderness experience was sent to expose the pharaohs and to redirect my worship back to God and my attention back to godly leadership that sounds like God so that I can reestablish my sense of worth. I know I have found my worth when I can say, like Caleb said, we are well able to take it. We are well able to possess the city. We are well able to possess whatever God has said. Even if I look over there and see my enemies waiting for me. Hey, I had enemies over there. See, that's the crazy thing about it. Don't get over here with God and act like act, act like you got to clutch your pearls because you see enemies. When you was living in hell, your enemies were there too. They tried to kill you over there too. Didn't. If we gonna if if, if they're gonna come for me, come for me over here in the promised land. But here's the thing I've learned now. You don't phase me because I already know my worth. Only way that you attack me back then because you attacked my sense of worth. But now I know who, who to go to to build me up so I can stand in the land that was promised to me. I hope this helped you, man. It's blessing me. <laughs> it is. It's blessing me. I want to lift my hand so bad right now and just tell God, talk to me. Talk to me. I, you know I love you. Just talk to me. Tell me something wonderful. Tell me this. I just This just happened. This just happened. What is it? What is it that I'm supposed to take out of this and come out of it better? What is it? Hmm. Listen, we're going to give you an offer for salvation tonight in hopes that somebody tuned in that hadn't said yes to Jesus. One way we can get to God is through Christ. You have to believe he came. He loved you so much. There's something so special about you. He died for you. You just have to accept that, what comes with that death. Even with all your baggage, don't worry about your baggage. Just worry about your yes. So if you can give me a yes, come on, repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And because of my confession and because of my faith, the Bible tells me I'm saved. Holy Spirit, I belong to you now. Come live inside of me. Help me to worship and give me my answers 
so I can give you your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. I hope you got this. It will change your life. All right. We'd love for you to support us before you go. We put it out there. We don't try to hustle and bustle you over this, over giving. We just keep trying to provide something of substance to you. And we hope that you think it's worthy of your investment, worthy of your obedience, worthy of the, we, the worthy place that you can put your tithes into so that you can obey God, not me, but so into us so that we can continue to do what we do. You can go to our website at cymm.org forward slash give. You can go to the Givelify app, find us on the app. You can mail it to us here at 9 Beth Drive, Greenville, South Carolina, 29609. You can also use our cash app, dollar sign, we are CYM. If you're watching tonight on Facebook, you can donate through Facebook. I jumped right into this lesson because I was so excited and I didn't ask y'all to share. I hope you already have a habit of sharing. If you didn't share, guess what? It's not too late. Share right now because they'll be able to click on the link and still watch what we talked about tonight. If you love them and you think this is worth them getting, share. Don't just share. Drop it in somebody's inbox so they'll know it came from you with some intention because you want them to be able to walk with you too as you both get your worth back. Thank you for believing in us. More importantly, thank you for believing in God. All right, till next time. Much love.